Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. With a continued passion for public television, we are proud to underwrite Informed Sources. Please join us in supporting WYES Television. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, there have been several major fires in the city's history, but this week marks the anniversary of the one that had the most victims. Fifty years ago, 32 people lost their lives in a French Quarter bar that had a primarily gay clientele. We'll look at what happened and public reaction then and now. Learning from the past was also a factor in a media investigation analyzing priest sex scandals through the years and how the church has responded to them. In politics, we'll look at the last days of the legislative session and the early campaigning for the state elections. And with summer having begun, our Future Watch segment looks at the condition of Lake Pontchartrain and Oxner Medical Center this week announced an alignment with a prestigious cancer institute. Feeling the pulse are tonight's informed sources. Errol Laborde, producer of informed sources, Ramon Antonio Vargas in his new position as weekend editor of The Guardian U.S., Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter, and Royd Anderson, documentary filmmaker. And we will stay with Royd because this weekend marks the 50th anniversary of the tragic upstairs lounge fire in the French Quarter. And you, about 10 years ago, 20, uh, 2013, right, did a documentary about this. And so right now, let's just take a look at a short clip from Royd's documentary. That is the doorway. And the most, the strongest image I've ever is the two guys walking out, the brownish blonde hair guy, brown hair, blondish hair, shorter one walking in the front, and the guy in the back kind of crouched down like this saying, the, well, that, what they said, what, what he said was, I'll teach you. And he walked on. And I tried to follow him, but I was too interested in getting across. Powerful to see and to hear. So the name of your documentary, Roy? The Upstairs just... Lounge Fire. That was the first film ever produced about the tragedy. You know, there were a couple more after that, a few months later, mm -hmm. ABC News, or a couple of years later. Because it was an amazing tragedy. And so why don't you just sort of quickly recount for us what happened and how it happened? It happened on Sunday. It was a beer bust. There was a, a, a special on beer, pitchers of beer, so they're for a very cheap price. So they were drinking a lot. Um, there was a member, the members of the MCC Church. There were many members there who were planning a fundraiser for the Cri Cripple Children's Hospital, which is now the Children's Hospital in Uptown. And uh, there was a patron in there, a gay man, Roger Nunez, who was. He was a peeping Tom. He was in the bathroom causing a lot of problems. Uh, Michael Scarborough, another patron, had enough of it. They got in a fist fight. Michael broke Roger Nunez's jaw. And as he's on the ground and the bartender is getting ready to kick him out or dragging him out, he proclaims, I'm going to burn this place to the effing ground. And within 10 minutes, the upstairs lounge is on fire. But there was no arrest which is infuriating to many today. And had that happened at Galatoire's, I think there would have been an arrest, but. And ultimately, mm. the suspect um, committed suicide just a couple of years later. He did. Um, so the men were trapped, really, in this place because there were bars in the windows and the fire raced up the stairway. So there was really no exit. It was just amazingly tragic. Yeah, they couldn't escape because of the burglar bars that were on the, on the windows and the escape routes weren't, weren't lit as they should have. Also, there was a lot of flammable material in that bar. So the inspectors, the, New Orleans, the city of New Orleans inspectors, they let that go like they did the, the Pan Am Flight 759 crash. 
the city of New Orleans owns that airport, and there was a wind shear detector on that runway that was mm -hmm. vandalized and broken, so, and they didn't do, it's, it was like that, so it's negligence. Right, yeah. there's, there's two points I'd like to qualify. One, you mentioned that church, the um, Metropolitan Church and all that, but that was a Christian church, and that was one of the few that was just openly for the purpose of, uh, um, of having a gay congregation and so that they were having an event. But from talking to you and just reading a little bit, the reason we happened to assume it was Nunes who did it, and all the evidence is that he was, was because he got into this fight. He was mad. He left. He says, I'm going to burn this thing down. But it wasn't necessarily an anti-gay thing or a homophobic thing. It may have been more of a revenge thing. Is that, is that correct? Is that the way you see it? That is correct. It was a gay-on-gay -gay crime, you know, so... When I made this movie in 2013, I was very surprised that the, the majority of the country and the world didn't know anything about this. I was getting calls from all over. The, the con I got a call from Princeton, like, we never heard about this. Uh, and, and they invited me up there on a, to screen the documentary on per diem. But I think it was primarily because it was a gay-on-gay gay crime and they didn't want it, to, it's not as, it wasn't a hate crime as you and me and, and us today think what a hate crime is. Right. At that time, um, the gay clientele at this bar, and people were not coming out, you know. They, any, anybody who was gay had to really sort of keep it a secret. And the, so the, the reaction of the community was not really very kind when this first happened, from the city government to the NOPD. Um, and of course, we've seen a lot of change over these past 50 years, but this was kind of a, a galvanizing moment for gay rights in the city of New Orleans. It exactly was, I mean, because uh, there was a memorial service at, at St. Mark's on Rampart Street, and there were um, uh, news cameras there, and this is the galvanizing moment. Uh, Troy Perry, who came from California, a very renowned preacher for the LGBT community, came down, and they were having a service at St. Mark's. That was the only church to hold a service for the victims of the fire. And the cameras were outside on Rampart Street, and he told them, hey, look, uh, the cameras are there, the, the, the gay members of the audience, you can go out the back way or you can go out the front row, uh, out the front door and meet the cameras. And a lady unidentified to this day said, we're going out the front door. And they went out the front door and that was the moment in, in New Orleans history for the LGBT, uh, LGBT community that they were galvanized. Uh, Standing up for their rights. Yeah, so they walked out uh, in front of the cameras. And so this weekend, it's a full weekend of events starting Friday going through Sunday um, to commemorate this moment in our history. Um, and included in this weekend of events is your documentary. That's going to be shown as well. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's screening at the Marriott Hotel. So everything's sold out, you know, mm -hmm. which I'm very happy to see that. Uh, but if then you can go to the Upstairs Lounge Fire Facebook page to find out more about that and also have a book on New Orleans disasters that does include the Upstairs Lounge, gone all the way from 72 to 99, and that's on Amazon. So, Right. The, the, the building where this happened, it still stands, right? It's on Iberville by Charters. If you pass by, some of you may recognize it. It's called the, the Gemini Cafe. Gemini with a J, I, I don't know. And so that first floor is still active as a, as a cafe. You've been to both the second and third floors. Is the, the second floor is mostly just storage now? It's just storage and office space. They, they store the beer. It was kind of like a surreal experience. They had a big uh, poster of Godfather Part Two. There's <laughs> apartments in there, you mm -hmm. know, too. It's, it's, it's almost like a labyrinth of rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a plaque now um, to mm -hmm. commemorate the fire there and yeah. the victims of the fire. And but we the third say that floor is where the real damage was. I mean, I mean, that's where the major part of the fire was. Right? Well, no, the, the second floor, right. the okay. second floor, the third floor was for vagrants. It was kind of like a, a flop house, but that did also sustain damage. But to this day, when you go up there, it's just kind of frozen in time. It's not being used and you could see, you could still see the burn marks. We should also quickly note that four individuals were buried too unidentified in unmarked graves and their families are now, at least the one family is trying to find a victim. So, all right, Roy, thanks a lot. And will your documentary be shown anyplace else if people are interested? We're, you know, we had one last night. We had a really mm -hmm. good screening uh, last mm -hmm. night in Metairie, but uh, 
uh, we'll keep you informed. Just okay. go to the Upstairs Lounge Fire okay. Facebook page and right. we'll keep you posted. All right. Thanks a lot, Roy. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ramon, over to you. And, uh, you know, you've been really covering the, the priest scandal in the Catholic Church and you uncovered some new information recently. Tell us about it. Yeah, I mean, it, in brief, it's uh, the uh, Lawrence Hecker, who was a retired priest, and he's long been publicly accused of being a uh, a, a child predator priest. Um, he, uh, I just was able to report that he confessed to uh, either abusing or harassing um, several children who he met through his work uh, as a priest in New Orleans, and that confession was in 1999. Um, he was sent to undergo a psychiatric evaluation that uh, determined that he was a pedophile and that he uh, and it recommended explicitly that the church not let him work around children or um, vulnerable adults mm -hmm. and uh, he was allowed to return to work for a couple of years um, as, as normal uh, around a congregation with people of all ages and then um, he was allowed to retire uh, when the uh, this topic of clerical abuse and cover up by uh, the abusers uh, superiors uh, erupted in Boston mm -hmm. in uh, in 2002, and so under duress he retires, uh, and another 16 years passed before uh, the, in, in, uh, before he was publicly um, acknowledged to be to be such as a as a predator, and in the interim the number of accusers only grew. So local church leadership, were they aware of this? Yeah, I mean, the, the record, the, the documents that I was able to examine and review and report on um, certainly established that, uh, I mean, at the absolute latest, um, he, acts that he describes in his own words um, that were abusive or harassment of children that were under his, uh, that he met through his work. Um, that's the absolute latest in 1999. Um, and then I think that, that that statement mentions a conversation that he had in 1988 with, uh, with Archbishop Philip Hannon about a prior allegation. So you're talking about Archbishop Hannon in 1988. You're talking about Archbishop Schulte in 1999. You're talking about Alfred Hughes in, uh, in, two, around in 2002 when he retires. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for his retirement wasn't disclosed at the time. Um, and then... Uh, and then, the, you know, Archbishop Amon became Archbishop in 2009. Uh, there were, there was a, in 2012, someone came forward with an allegation against Lawrence Hecker um, that he was a, a memo <coughs> addressed directly to the Archbishop uh, that has, contains the phrase, this is the ninth, all capitals, ninth allegation against Larry Hecker. Um, and so, and that was in 2012, and so another six years passed before the decision was made to publicly acknowledge him as being a credibly accused uh, child predator. The issue with that list is that mm -hmm. it contained many other people and it made no distinction between, uh, his work history was incomplete and it made no distinction between, was it one allegation, was it 20 allegations uh, among the various people on the list. So. And that's a list that the Archdiocese released, when was that? In uh, yeah. early of November of 2018. 2018. And that was in response to pressure to come clean about um, you know abusive clerics in, uh, that worked in this community. And since the Archdiocese has declared bankruptcy, right? Yes, and the effect that that has had, and, and in part, it, the bankruptcy was prompted in part by lawsuits that were uh, that followed the release of that list. And uh, the effect that that had is that um, it's it's put a lot of the documents that outlined this uh, under seal, uh, very difficult to access. Um, was able to uh, to access a, a, some of them that um, obviously set established that pattern of knowing a lot well before it was uh, publicly acknowledged to, to, the, to the public in, in this region, which counts about a half million Catholics. Mm. So Lawrence Hecker, where is he now? He's living out his retirement. He's 91. He's living in his apartment in New Orleans um, for a long time until uh, 2020. The, you mentioned the bankruptcy filing. Mm -hmm. That elicited an order from the bankruptcy judge to stop retirement benefits to priests like Lawrence Hecker, but until then he was he had his retirement benefits. He had his, uh, you know, his archdiocesan paid apartment. Um, he is living out his retirement. He is under investigation by the district attorney's office. That became clear. They, they just requested successfully to get files from the archdiocese. Uh, and that happened on June 14th, 2023, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So and, fairly recently. Uh, fairly, fairly recently. Um, and again, we've established that at the absolute latest, you're talking about 1999, when there's a confession to abusive or acts or uh, harassment of children under his supervision. Um, but it, that whether that investigation leads to charges uh, remains to be seen. It remains to be seen right now. Couldn't you try to call him or somebody working with you? or? 
No, yeah, I mean, I spoke, I, I did call him in, in the process of reporting that story, and um, he said he had an appointment to get to. I know that uh, WDSU recently, um, you know, spoke with him and asked him pointedly, have you ever touched the children, uh, have you ever touched any child? And um, he didn't answer the question, you know, he said that there was, I think it was, the phrase was, it was there's good and bad and, and people, and I'm scared that this is a trap. Uh, I think that until very recently, if you got him on the phone, he was inclined to, to talk. Um, and in the, the documents, you see how he kind of would rationalize. You know, it was the 60s. It was a different time. Um, and then at one point, very chilling phrase, well, I thought I could beat the system. Um, mm. and, uh, and so, yeah, he was very, uh, but I, I understand that more recently, if you'd see the local coverage, I think the times Picayune um, reached out to him, and uh, he put the reporter on hold and hung up. So. Okay, but I know that you'll stay on it. Yes. You'll keep us posted. All yes, right, Ramon, thanks a lot. Thank you. E, over to you. Some big news from Oxner. I think it's really big news. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, a partnership that Oxner has established with MD Anderson. You know, I have personally known of two people who've been diagnosed with a fairly serious degree of cancer, and both of them had, over the course of a couple of years, periodically go to Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they and the partner would go there, they'd stay, you know, have to fly there, go for a few days and come back. And it really made me angry every time I heard about it because I'm thinking, why can't somebody from New Orleans be able to take Uber to get this kind of treatment instead of Southwest Airlines? Yeah. You know? uh, I mean, and, and we're a medical center, and we're the city where Alton Oxner pioneered cancer uh, with smoking. Mm -hmm. all that. And, and so we have quite a heritage in healthcare, but yet all these people having to go to Houston to get this kind of treatment. And I know it was hard on these people in a very emotional time. So. MD Anderson has developed various types of partnerships with hospitals around the country. This current relationship uh, in which uh, Oxner is considered to be a, a, a partner program is the highest level and the, and the most serious. There are seven of those relationships. It was announced that with great fanfare, the head of MD Anderson even came and uh, Michael Hex said, this is a great moment in, in cancer health care in Louisiana. This is going to be something that's really different. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's very encouraging. You might remember a few years ago, East Jefferson right. uh, announced a, a program, a tie-in with MD Anderson. This is not the same thing. Uh, what they had was called a certified uh, program. And it was one where they shared information, but it wasn't the level of involvement that this is. And that particular relationship ended in, two, in 2019. And so this is the beginning of a relationship with MD Anderson. That section, the cancer care, is going to, is going to now be called um, the Oxner MD Anderson Cancer Center. Which and there's shows, new uh, signage on the yeah, building. Yeah. yeah, which shows a pretty serious commission. And so it's, um, it's a great thing for New Orleans. It really is a great thing for New Orleans. And so the idea is that people won't have to be going to Houston all the time. They'll Absolutely. be able to stay yeah. home for that level of care. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they can get that label care and go home in their own bed that night instead of having to go back and forth to Houston. And, and that's so and, important. And, and, and I guess the really important thing is that they're getting what, what may be the best cancer care in the world uh, at that level, too. So it's really good news for the community as yeah. well as good news for Oxner. All right, E, thanks a lot. Okay, Don, over to you. It is summertime, and boy, it is hot out there, and people might feel like jumping into the lake, literally, can they? They can. They, they absolutely can. The lake... Um, you know, it has its, it, it ebbs and flows just like all water sources do, and it depends on the heat, it depends on water runoff, it depends on how many storms we have, it depends on whether or not we've had to open the Bonnie Carey Spillway as to how healthy the lake is at any given time. The um, Pontchartrain Conservancy measures the quality of the water at 13 different points, both on the North Shore and the South Shore, to test water quality. And as of this week's measurements, there are two stations, both of them on the North Shore, that are reporting not healthy for swimming. All the rest are reported healthy for swimming. Anybody can look it up, Punch Train Conservancy on their website. You also can learn how to test it yourself and go to their lab. You can fill out some paperwork and go figure out how to do water sampling yourself. Um, there have been some reports of people spotting algae in the lake. According mm -hmm. to, to the Conservancy, none of those algae blooms have been the toxic kind yet. You can't tell if it's toxic or not toxic by looking at it. You, you want to be careful to pay attention to their sampling to know whether or not it's good for you or bad for you. Well, bad for you. Mm -hmm. um, the 
But the spillway wasn't open this year, and that's good because when the spillway is open, it changes the salinity of the water, it yeah. changes everything that's able to grow, and all signs right now are that we have a healthy lake with healthy fish and plants and wildlife and birds, bald eagles spotted on the lake, egrets, um, pelicans, no porpoises. Porpoises don't come to our water. They like colder waters, but we do have dolphins in the area. Mm -hmm. They haven't been spotted in Lake Pontchartrain yet this year, but they have been spotted um, in Lake Catherine for sure. Um, and there is a manatee that has been spotted near the North Shore. This manatee is a tagged manatee. His name is Texas T. Miguel. Um, <laughs> he, has, he was rescued in Texas a couple of years ago when the water there was too cold for his survival. He was rehabbed in Florida, released into the waters in Florida, and they've been watching with that tag, watching him move, and he is moving west. So maybe he's going home to Texas, but he's finding the healthy water mm -hmm. for the manatee population. Does he have a girlfriend? The way. I, as far as I know, he's by himself in the water. Um, so it, it, it is healthy. It's healthy for swimming. It's healthy for boating. You are urged to check the quality of the water before you head out there. Look at those research stations. Look around on hot summer days. The runoff just on one day from one parking lot or one area can really affect the water in a specific area. The lake is large, so it's, it has different environments right. within it regularly. No, good thing is that we didn't have high waters in the river this year, so that they didn't need to open the floodgate. Right. right. And floodgate, that always creates a big mess when that happens. Right. But as the floodgate has opened over the years and closed over the years and, and things have changed, the salinity levels in the water have changed, have really gone down. And that reduction in salinity has made it better for um, cypress plantings and swamp forest mm -hmm. re reforestation and restoration so we can help rebuild and prevent storm surge too based on the health of the lake. Are there any areas right now around this time at any rate, we know that things change, you know, so you have to keep checking, but are there any areas that are recommended that you stay out for right now? Yes, two on the North Shore, and I'm going to butcher the names of them, so I'm just going to leave, let people look it up for themselves, but they're right in the Mandeville Beach area. In the Mandeville, okay, mm -hmm. all right, so uh, go where again? Where can folks check? Look up Pontchartrain Conservancy, okay. and then you can look at a map, It's and you can click on each location on the map and see what they've tested for and how it's tested and and know it's safe for swimming. It's not safe for swimming. It's It'll come in three different colors, green, yellow, or yeah. red. There is a yellow near Lincoln Beach right now on the South Shore, but not red. The mm -hmm. two red red locations are both on the you know, North Shore. What was really amazing is how quickly the lake cured itself after Hurricane Katrina. With all the goop that was that was pumped into the lake, that people thought this is dead forever. It, right. But ultimately, I think mean, we see that in Bay St. Louis as well. Mm -hmm. All the, the the natural resources really do have a way of fixing themselves. As long as you don't dredge shells and Correct. things. Correct. You know, right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so that, well, that's good news. Yes. That really so is it, a nice healthy. Get lake. out there on a boat. Get out there and swim safely. And go um, search for Texas T. I I mean, if we want to leave him alone. Texas really, but, T. Miguel. But, um, yeah, if you see him, leave him alone. But it would be really, He's you know, tagged, you said, it's like a little he, buoy his on His tag it. looks like a buoy, almost with a bowl on top of it, so he stick, it sticks up out of the water so that he's not in danger of yeah. boaters. Because if you haven't seen a manatee in the water before, they really do, they're like big gray blobs. They'd be, yeah. and they get damaged by boats a good bit of the time. Louisiana is better than going back to Texas. Well, I don't know if we can keep Texas tea here train. or not, but maybe we'll try. <laughs> okay, Don, thanks a lot. Hey, we're going back over to you because uh, legislative section, session sort of ended chaotically. They're, they're still dealing with it right now up in Baton Rouge. Yeah, um, and, and next week, uh, I think it's Wednesday, the, the governor has announced that's going to be the day that he's going to make his, his announcement on what he's doing in terms of yeah. vetoes and all that. Meanwhile, in the governor's election today, there was, I guess what you call a debate or a big forum uh, by the Louisiana Real Estate Association, whatever they, I, mean, I mean, Agriculture Association. They invited all the candidates. Uh, it was here in New Orleans to talk about agriculture policies. This is not a hot button issue uh, in, in, in this campaign. I mean, you look at most of the campaigns. But it's, it's a very important issue. It is. Out in the, uh, yeah, out in the, out in the earth. And, and, and Senator Kennedy came. Um, who just to advise the people what's being going on at the federal level. And so what happened there was actually, I guess, the first strike. It was probably more important, instead of advising the formers about which candidate, advising the candidates about what's on, you know, what's on the former's mm -hmm. mind. And so that was it. 
In, in, in terms, you get a lot by the television commercials. And in terms of the television commercials, uh, you know, we've been seeing for a few weeks uh, Jeff Landry and Steve Waggis mm -hmm. back going after each other. And the more I think about it, I think that's probably because ultimately this campaign, the runoff can be two Republicans. And we know Jeff Landry is going to probably be one. And they're worried about Waggis back. And so I think they're trying to kind of muddy him up a little bit uh, in case he gets them. But another Republican, though, John Schroeder, mm -hmm. uh, has, been doing a lot of uh, has been having, and he's not part of that war against the other yeah. two, but he's been doing something, doing like issues across the board. But everybody's oh. talking about crime. That's going to really be, right. you know, the, the hot button issue. Okie doke. We'll be looking forward. We have months ahead of campaigning. Yeah. Okay, other stories, Ian. But you. before all that, there will be, actually after all that, there'll be Mardi Gras. Uh, January 27th is the... Um, uh, the Washington Ball, and it was announced yesterday that the king of the Washington Ball will be Drew Brees. Huh. Um, and Senator Kennedy, the congressman rotate being captain, and, and, and Senator Kennedy is the, the captain this year, but Drew Brees, 75th anniversary of the huh. Washington Ball. Well, that'll be fun for him. Okay, Ramon. I have a new book coming out. Uh, oh, on, it's on paperback, on Kindle, uh, on Amazon available. It's uh, Family Gangsters and Champions of the Life and World of Boxer Tony Canzanieri. Uh, oh, right. So, yeah. All right, Ramon, we'll be looking for that. Uh, Great. Don, over to you. If you're not on the bandwagon yet, um, LSU plays for the College World Series tomorrow. Um, every young child who's been a baseball player in the city of New Orleans has a team to be, or in the area, has a, has a team to be watching, and they're going to hope to to best Florida, unlike the way they did in 2017. So two. it's a lot of fun for the region. Too. Two out of three, right? Two out so of three. So in the First finals. game is Saturday. All right, go Tigers. Right over to you. At 3.30 tomorrow on Saturday, there's going to be a memorial service for the victims of the fire and also a second line preceding afterwards all the way. We're going to march all the way to the former side of the upstairs lounge, which okay. is the Jiminy. All Please, right. all are invited. Yeah, right now. Oh, so it continues through Sunday, too. So take a look for events then. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us around the table. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. With a continued passion for public television, we are proud to underwrite Informed Sources. Please join us in supporting WYES Television. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.